Welcome everyone, also on Moodle, if you're watching it later. Um, today we will have gene expression analysis. So gene expression analysis is um, the analysis of genes and the expression of them and figuring out how active the genome is at certain points. So um, don't forget to register for the exam. I put this slide in like every time. Um, the exam will be on March 4th, so make sure that two weeks before you are registered, otherwise I cannot let you participate. Um, which is always a shame. There's always like this one guy that forgot to register and really wants to do the exam and has to wait for the re-exam, so don't be that guy. Good, so register now if you can. Um, if you have any problems with registration, let me know as soon as possible and then I can um, argue with the Prüfungsbüro. All right, so this is the overview for today. So we will be talking about experimental design, um, some questions that we can answer using gene expression data or questions or common questions that people want to have answered when they do these kinds of experiments. Um, we will talk about some normalization, the difference between different types of normalization. Uh, we will talk about statistical analysis, of course, like the gene expression profiling and multiple testing issues that come with measuring 50,000 uh, genes. Hey, Commando, welcome to the stream. Um, I will talk a little bit about gene ontology and pathway analysis, and I want to talk a little bit more about visualizations and stuff. Um, but of course, before we start the lecture, we have to go and do the assignments from last week. So the assignments from last week were all regarding sequence analysis. Um, I hope they weren't too hard. It was more like copy pasting like the things in and kind of figuring out what the individual buttons do for um, the cluster W. Um, I Hey Alexander, welcome to the stream as well. Um, so yeah, it, it, like turning these knobs on on the different parameters that you uh, that you can set is um, having a big effect in the end on different um, alignments that you do between sequences. Um, the thing here is is that I asked you guys to do cluster W, and then in the assignments it had like an old link. Um, so I hope that everyone was able to find a website where they offer to do cluster W, especially since it's a little bit older, right? Um, nowadays, everyone uses cluster omega, um, which uses kind of AI to figure out the best kind of parameter options, or it has like this smart learning uh, technique to, to figure out what's going on. Um, so, but let's just start. So, so in the assignments, um, we had um, several sequences that we wanted to analyze. So we had one query sequence and then four different sequences of beta lactamase, um, which is um, a, a protein which is breaking down uh, lactose. Um, and um, have, there was also a dehydrase in there. But had the idea was is that you would just take the sequences and throw them into cluster W. Um, so let me show you guys my Firefox window. I actually just threw them in. So I was using the genome.jp cluster W um, tool, um, just because the one that I gave you guys a link to was not available. Um, and I already just copy pasted them in, right? Because it can take a little while for these things to run, um, so just do not waste any time today on waiting for websites loading. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to just put them in. Yeah, so you can see here that it received five different sequences. It lists the length of the sequence, so all of these are protein sequences. Um, it started pairwise alignment, and then hey, it aligned all of the different things to each other, so it, it just did like a matrix of one versus two, one versus three, and so on. And then in the end, it shows you here the alignment file. Um, so the first question uh, was to which sequence is our query sequence most similar? So for this, it's really hard to see that, right? Because you, you can't really see that here. Um, this is more or less the graphical overview of the, of the tree that is being produced when it aligns these sequences together. Um, but the thing is, you can select here the tree menu. Um, so you can select different options to cluster them. Um, so I just took the standard one. And then when you do that, it shows you this picture. Um, and this picture is more or less uh, what you need to answer the first question. So answering the first question is that the query sequence is around 96% similar, or it has a, um, it has a very small distance uh, to the beta lactamase 2 uh, found in the Bacillus sp1 species. So 
that was the first question. So to which sequence is our query sequence most similar um, so that it is most related to the beta-lactamase 2 and then the next one is the beta-lactamase 2 of the uh, bacteroids F and then of course here you have the other kind of tree which is the beta-lactamase precursor and the dehydrogenase. Um, but all right, so the second question, how many amino acids are identical between all sequences? So if we just look at the alignment, we can see that um, every time we see a star, it means that all of the amino acids were similar at that position. Um, so in this case, it's just counting up all the stars. I didn't count up all the stars, but that's a question for you guys, but it's like one, two, three, three or something. So you can see that, that eh, these sequences are relatively diverse. You can also see that for eh, like the large regions where there's actually no real overlap. Hey, so you see that the first two sequences are very similar when you look at it, eh, but then if you look at the third sequence then you see that that, it, that is kind of different, right? You see that there are like little blocks at which this third sequence here um, is similar to the first two sequences, eh, but it's 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 almost a little bit like trash in, trash out, right? Because the, the alignment is, is not that good. Um, hey, of course, the alignment between the first two is, is relatively good. Um, the third one also seems to fit, so the bacteroids, hey, but the precursor itself is, is not really looking very uh, similar. Um, so question 3a, how many amino acids are highly conserved between all of the sequences? Um, so here we have to count all the double points because double points means kind of they are not the exact same amino acid, um, but it's an amino acid which has a very similar um, um, kind of uh, structure. Biochemically speaking, they are very similar. And this, of course, has to do with which matrix you use to kind of define how amino acids are related to each other. And if you take a Blossom matrix or a PAM matrix, this, of course, has an influence on what the algorithm considers to be similar and what it considers to be different. So, but yeah, just add up all the double point ones and those are the ones which are highly conserved. Of course, we have the ones which are weakly conserved as well, but there wasn't a question about that, but those are the dots in the sequence. You can also see that it actually introduces quite large gaps at some positions just because this beta-lactamase precursor sequence is quite different from the other ones. Um, hey, of course, it still has some similarity, um, but there are really big gaps in the um, beta-lactamase 2 compared to the beta-lactamase precursor protein. Alright, so then the next question was to change all the parameters one by one, have put them extremely low, put them extremely high. And that's normally when you want to figure out what something is doing, just change everything or everything one by one, right? So hey, you take the first parameter, you put in a, a very low value compared to the standard, um, and then hey, you look to see what the difference is, and then you put a really high value in it. Um, so the question here was, can you find uh, parameters at which the alignment is complete nonsensical? Um, and of course you can find parameters at which the alignment is completely nonsensical. So I hope that everyone found a parameter set for which the alignments did not make sense, um, but had the idea was that in the process process of changing all of these parameters to see what they more or less do. And so use a different matrix um, for the uh, substitution probabilities um, and use like extreme settings for like gap opening and gap closing penalties and because if you set a very high gap opening penalty and then of course the, the gap that, that is introduced at this point of course cannot be introduced. It would rather go with like all of the mismatches than introduce a gap there. All right, then question number four was um, a little bit more of you guys having to deal with Ensemble because hey, I think that Ensemble is one of these websites which is quite fundamental in bioinformatics. It's kind of the core where everyone kind of gets their information from and it's like one of these central starting points. Um, but it is good to practice a lot with it, right? Um, so the first step was to download the myostatin gene, the DNA and the protein sequence. So when I say the DNA sequence, I of course mean the coding sequence, so the cDNA sequence, um, from ensemble for humans, gorillas, mouse, pig, chickens, and a species of your own interest. So I bet many of you guys went for a fish. And I don't know, do fish actually have a myostatin gene or do they regulate like growth um, of muscles differently than other animals? Anyway, you, you could just add a fish or you could say, well, um, I, I take a dolphin, right? Because dolphins, they're still mammals, so they're relatively close to like humans and gorillas and mice. Um, but uh, 
So hey, of course the, the first thing that you need to do is search for the myostatin gene. So let me just copy it. So I'm just going to search and I have been having some issues with ensemble and I figured out that all of the issues that I've been having that yeah, because it, it like last week also it was really slow um, and I figured out that if I just force it to use the HTTPS site so that, that if I just go and I, I type in ensemble for some reason it redirects me to the unprotected site and the unprotected site seems to be really slow compared to the kind of HTTPS site. I don't know why that is it should actually force you to kind of upgrade to HTTPS but it's probably a misconfiguration at their end that they serve out the web page over over an unsecure line which in theory is okay right because like who's going to man in the middle a query to ensemble but in theory they could um, but by changing it to HTTPS it, it turned out that it was much much faster in searching and, and these kinds of things so um, I, I think they just have a misconfiguration all right, so go to the myostatin gene. Um, it's called MSTN. It, of course, has uh, uh, GDF8 for growth dependent factor 8 um, as a synonym. Um, and then, of course, hey, if you want to export data, use the export data button. Hey, and in this case, um, we want to always have FASTA sequences. Um, we want to have the feature strand. It doesn't make sense to go the other way around. Um, so for this, I would say just use it unmask. Um, because we're only interested in the cDNA and not so much in the coding sequence, not so much in the exon, but we want to have the peptide sequence as well, right? The protein sequence. Um, they call it a peptide here, um, which is more accurate in a way. And we had the lecture about proteins, amino acids, peptides, and the differences. And so if, if, if you talk about a protein without the cofactors, um, then it's called a, a peptide. All right, and then we just click next. Um, then we want to say, well, we just want to have it in text. And then here we get the uh, decoding sequence here, um, so the, the cDNA. And then we have the, the peptide. And then here we have the chromosomal DNA. And of course, the chromosomal DNA is not that interesting because it also contains the introns. Uh, we're not really interested in the introns. Um, so you select the first two parts, right? And you just copy paste it to a um, text document. Um, so let me do that. Um, and of course you want to separate the DNA sequences for from the protein sequences, right? Clustal or alignments uh, cannot deal with two different sequence types. Um, and hey, you repeat that um, every time. So after you've built up your, uh, um, your uh, file, which has the six um, protein sequences or the, the human, gorilla, mouse, pig, chicken, and your species of interest. And so that's actually seven. Um, the idea was to just uh, use cluster cluster W to find the overlap in the DNA sequence similarity and the overlap in the protein sequence similarity. So the the idea was, um, had the question here is, is there more selective pressure to conserve a DNA sequence or a protein sequence between different species? So if you did this, and I'm not going to download all of them and run it for you guys, but had the idea is, is that DNA is able to change more than the proteins are. And the protein is something that has an effector function. And so although certain amino acids can change, if there's too much change, then it doesn't work. Um, but since every amino acid is coded by three base pairs and the third base pair is the wobble base, which is not that interesting, or and it, it kind of allows, it, it is allowed to vary, um, and the DNA sequence is not as conserved as the protein sequence is. So that's the answer to the fifth question. So hey, is there more selective pressure to conserve DNA sequence or protein sequence? There is more pressure um, to preserve the, uh, the uh, protein sequences. All right, so if there's any questions, um, then let me know. Um, I, I think the assignments were relatively easy well, because it's kind of copy paste and just looking at what happens and changing some parameters. So I was able to, or I hope that everyone was able to kind of do the assignments and um, got more or less uh, an idea of um, how, what the idea was that you were supposed to learn. So uh, the thing that you are supposed to learn is a little bit more practicing downloading stuff from Ensemble and a little bit more more practicing with looking at how alignments and how certain parameters of the alignment um, kind of have an influence on the eventual alignment. And so in a case um, where I would make an exam question um, saying, um, hey, I have an alignment, what would happen with the alignment that you see here if I put the gap opening penalty to 1500? And then you should be able to kind of answer this question and say, well, if you would 
set the gap opening penalty to 1500 and then it would not allow you to open gaps and so then it would kind of start misaligning after the first gap that we see in the uh, original alignment. Alright, so don't see any questions in chat so we will continue then with uh, the lecture for today. So the overview for today um, let me switch to it myself. So the overview we already discussed, um, so let's just start. Um, I think it's going to be a short lecture today. Um, I do have a lot of slides, 51, um, but I think we can be relatively quick. Would you like to do this in practice with Biomart or online? Um, how do you mean? The, the, exporting the sequences of myostatin. Um, I would do it using Biomart. So that would that would be my, my preferred way of doing it because like I like programming in R, right? So um, I do everything in R. Um, I, I would also do the alignments in R because there's also a package called MSA for multiple sequence alignments in R. Um, so if anyone is interested, I can show you guys the... Um, <laughs> if anyone's interested, I could show you the, the little code that I made to do like multiple sequence alignments of the SARS-CoV-2 protein. Um, so, because hey, at the beginning, um, everyone was interested in SARS and where it came from. And um, hey, so I made a little sequence or I made a little script which downloads all of these. All right, good. So then we will look at it after the lecture, right? I don't think that the people watching it on Moodle are that interested to kind of switch. Um, but hey, if we keep the lecture short, then we have like uh, probably like 45 minutes um, at the end where we can just do some R coding and look at SARS-CoV-2 and some particularities of the uh, of, of the virus. Um, the warning in advance is real. Um, the assignments are tough because I want you guys to do a little bit in R, right? We had the R introduction lecture. Um, so the, the assignments for today have a lot of R. Um, I gave you guys a, 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 a subset of one of the microarray data sets that we did and I want you guys to kind of struggle and kind of see if you can figure it out for yourself. So the, the, the assignments are difficult and I know that from previous years and of course if you have any question and you're, you get stuck then uh, just ask me by email um, and I can just help you guys figure it out. And so, but do try it first yourself. It's not like it, that if you, you you type a little bit of code and after like two minutes you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then try for like half an hour. And if after half an hour you're still stuck, um, then just send me an email and I will be monitoring my email during the weekend. Um, so I really hope that, that people just send in their questions and I, I can help you guys. Um, if I get like, people getting stuck at the same point, then I might just um, put something or send something to everyone uh, via the Moodle thing. So, um, because then we can just use the mailing list. If I get the same question three times, then I will just mail everyone back. All right, so first question about like uh, experimental design, right? Why would you want to do a microarray experiment? Why would you want to measure the expression level of genes, right? Because we know that the expression of genes um, and like in the end, it's not about the gene expression. It's not about how much mRNA is produced. It's about how many proteins are produced, right? Um, so the questions here are, which genes are differentially expressed between healthy and diseased tissue? And this is something that we work with a lot. And so if you have a certain disease or uh, for example, a certain cancer, and then we want to know which genes are different in the cancer tissue compared to healthy tissue. And because if we know what is different, then we can design like therapeutic targets um, that either bring down the, uh, the expression of a certain gene or hey, we can develop therapeutica that will target cells which have a certain level of expression of a certain gene and for example force them into apoptosis. Um, and of course there's more fundamental things that you can learn. And so for example in cancer research one of the major things that came out uh, when you look at, at cancer tissue versus other tissues hey, is that um, usually um, cell cycle control genes seem to be broken. So there are normally like three or four checkpoints when a cell replicates and duplicates um, and 
a lot of these genes that normally would become active during the cell cycle, during these checkpoints, had to make sure, for example, that the DNA is properly duplicated. Um, these genes do not become active in cancer tissue or they become overactive in cancer tissue. Yeah, allowing the cancer to um, just blast through the cell cycle and just multiply like mad. One of the other things is um, which genes are expressed in which tissue. Hey, of course it's very interesting, especially um, like we're doing a lot here with research about um, uh, different tissues that are involved in like obesity and the met metabolic syndrome. Hey, so we are looking a lot like things like um, what is happening in the fat, what's happening in the muscles, hey, what's happening in the liver and the pancreas and these kinds of things. Hey, and then we, want, we, we try to kind of look to see what hey, if we have different mouse strains to see which genes are differentially expressed between the different strains but also between the different tissues uh, in the hope that we learn um, something about what genetic factors are underlying like obesity and metabolic syndrome yeah, because of course um, it's nice that when you suffer from obesity that you go to a doctor and the doctor says well you should eat less or exercise more um, but for some people that doesn't work because they just have a genetic predisposition to become fat and if, if you have a genetic predisposition then you want to know on a, on a molecular level what's going wrong to see if you can kind of help these people this way. Um, one of the other questions which is kind of important is how does gene expression change after the administration of a drug or other treatment and this is of course a major field of research so um, we can kind of look into that as well. So microarrays, very short history overviews, they were developed in like the 1980s or starting 1980s and of course they weren't called microarrays back then, they were more or less macroarrays, so they were like these glass plates which were 9 by 12 centimeters um, and you would have like a very early 3D printer kind of thing, um, which, well, it would not work in a, a Z level. So it's kind of a 2D printer, um, and this printer would be loaded with all kinds of different probes. Um, we still use these probes, so these oligos. And what this printer would do, it would just leave little dots um, of very accurately measured amounts of, um, of, of these probes and it would print them on this little glass slide. Um, and then hey, in, the or in the 1980s hey, we were able to make these little glass slides 9 by 12 centimeters hey, and you would have a little dot every like um, half centimeter. Um, hey, that would mean like 18 dots by like 24 dots so you would be able to measure like 100 to 200 genes. And so a microarray in itself is nothing more than a collection of microscopic of, or macroscopic DNA dots attached to a solid surface. And in each spot um, in, in, in current microarrays, so the ones that you can buy currently, uh, they contain around 10 to the minus 12 moles of a specific DNA sequence. And this DNA sequence is called a probe. Um, although some people also call them reporters or oligos. And so they are... They, they, different scientists have different names um, yeah, because the word probes is sometimes also used for um, like uh, markers in the genome. And so um, if you really want to be accurate uh, they should be called oligos because they're oligonucleotides um, yeah, and they're not longer than like 30 base pairs on average so that would still classify as an oligonucleotide. Um, so yeah, the idea is, is that they target um, labeled cDNA um, and the, the labeling of cDNA can be done using a fluidophore, which is more or less the most common nowadays, but in the old days people also used silver labeled or uh, chemiluminescence, uh, so they would use like a chemical luminescence uh, to make the probes uh, light up. And then had, uh, what, what is done is that you, you, you add these, hey, you add your colored DNA of your sample to your microarray, hey, the, the DNA kind of swims over and if there's a match between the, the oligo on the array and a sequence which is in the labeled DNA they will they will bind together and then hey, depending on the intensity that you see you know how much binding there was. Um, so hey, hybridization, so the, the coupling of the DNA of the target with the oligo is detected by an intensity and it gives you a relative abundance of the target sequence. And had the relative part here is important because we will get back to that because normally you would want to get an absolute quantification but microarrays generally don't give you that. Um, 
So I have very short workflow overview. So how would you do that? So you have your sample, for example, I have a certain bacterial culture. And so I, I pick some of these colonies and I do some purification, right? Because hey, I have to kind of centrifuge them down. Um, hey, so, um, or I separate them using water and uh, phenol. Um, so if you, hey, if you have water mixed with phenol, then those will kind of float on top of each other, which is a very common. And the uh, mRNA will be in the water phase while the proteins and the DNA will be left in the phenol phase. Hey, you then take the water phase with the mRNA, um, you add a reverse transcriptase, which makes cDNA, of course, because you can only use DNA to bind to DNA, um, hey, which is called the reverse transcriptase step or the RT step. And then uh, in the next uh, step, you have the coupling and the coupling just means that you add a dye to your label or to your cDNA, right? So you have your cDNA, you add a dye. Normally we use C3 or C5. So C5 is a red color, uh, a red fluorophore and C C3, uh, Psi3 is a, is a green fluorophore. And then you label your DNA. The next step is, is that you, you, you hybridize it to the slide, right? So you just pipe it your sample on this little glass plate um, and then you wash it. So hey, there's a, there's a time that you use to have it hybridized. And after it's hybridized, you wash away the DNA, which had not hybridized to the array. Um, you put it in one of these machines and it, the, the machine has a laser in there, which kind of lights up the fluorophore and it scans the intensity of the fluorophore back. Um, and then in the end, you get like a, an intensity ratio plot um, and you have to do normalization and analysis, which of course happens in a computer. And so hybridization, this is the crucial step. Hybridization is of course based on the fact that complementary DNA sequences um, kind of bind together in a, um, how do you call it, in a way that you can kind of undo. Um, there's a nice word for that. Anyway, but hey, they, they bind together based on, on, on hydrogen bonds. So it's not a, 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 a binding which is, um, which is always there um, or which is, it's a reversible binding, right? So based on the, on the temperature, you can reverse the binding. And that is because it's hydrogen bonding. And so these things, they, they, they kind of fit together. And of course, the more complementary a base pair is, the more tight, tighter this bound is between the two DNA probes or between the, the target DNA and the oligo on the array, right? So hey, if you have a very, um, Hey, if you have a lot of mismatches, then the binding won't be as strong. Hey, and that is why you have the washing step, because the, in the washing step, you want to get rid of all of the DNA that has not been properly bound. Um, and of course, hey, that has an influence on, on how accurate the microarray and the binding is. Hey, but the hybridization, remember, it's always based on complementary binding, based on the hydrogen bonds. And again, here you have the issue that a CG pair has three hydrogen bonds and an AT pair has only two hydrogen bonds. So an AT base pair binding is just weaker than a CG base pair binding. And you have to take that into account. Um, and especially when um, you do the analysis and you start like looking at the intensity, then also the intensity is of course affected by the number of A's and T's versus the number of A's, C's and G's in the probe that you are using or the oligo that you are using on the array. So, but this is more or less how it looks. So there are two types of microarray. You have single channel microarray of one channel microarray um, and that it provides the intensity data for each probe or a probe set indicating a relative level of hybridization within with the target label. And then you have two channel microarrays which are um, HEP where you can take two different samples. Have, for example, cancer cells on the one hand, normal cells on the other hand. Hey, you label the one with uh, the red color, you label the other one with the green color, hey, you combine them and then you hybridize the combined sample. Um, of course, here in the, in, when you combine them, hey, you want to combine them based on the fact that you have a certain concentration eh, because you want the concentrations more or less to match. Um, hey, but the, the, the two channel microarray um, is, a is often used when you compare disease tissue versus healthy tissue. And hey, that is also why we have these two complementary colors, Psi3 and Psi5, hey, because that allows us to kind of view um, if a gene is highly expressed in the cancer cells or if it's higher expressed in the normal cells. Yeah, so this is more or less how a scanned microarray looks. So this is just one of uh, one of these TIFF files as an example. Yeah, and then when you zoom in, so here you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So this is twelve by four. So this is a forty-eight 
um, slide microarrays, so there's 48 little microarrays on a single glass plate, and, but each of these arrays targets an X number of genes. And of course this is just a cutout because normally these, and these a single microarray contains like 20,000 or 200,000 little dots. Um, yeah, but yeah, all of the microarrays, they come in slides. A slide has multiple microarrays on there. And that is important when you plan your experiment, because when you plan your experiment, you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind that you always pay per slide and not per microarray. So hey, if you, if you have a type of microarray which comes on a 96 microarray slide, that means that you have to do 96. Um, because you pay for the whole thing, so if you only have 30 samples, then 64 slots on the array or on the on the slide are not used. And generally, when people talk about a microarray, they mean like the the single kind of array which is on there, so the single little matrix. Um, and when they talk about a slide, then they talk about the whole thing. Um, but there's always a ratio, right? So um, and that's why you see in a lot of papers that deal with gene expression that people do like 94 samples and not 100. And have people always wonder when they read the papers, why didn't you do like 100 samples or why didn't you do like 20? Uh, have, why did you do 16? And this of course has to do with the fact that microarrays just come in like a rectangular layout and often it's like four microarrays in the, in the in the column or in the rows and an X number in the columns. So had the most common ones are um, 16, 32, 64, and 90, uh, 96. All right, so I had the applications. We already talked a little bit about the questions that you can answer when you have microarray data or when you're investigating microarray data. Yeah, but um, some of the applications where people use it is, for example, comparative hybridization to compare the activity of the DNA in one sample versus the other sample. Um, but also when you are comparing a new unknown species to an old species. So you can also use it to kind of do like a DNA profiling. And so you're, if you're in the rainforest and you just find like this little bug where you kind of don't know what the bug is or in which clade it belongs and then you can hybridize it to different um, known samples and from that you can kind of learn in which type of, of clade of animals you need to look. Um, more generally it's used for expression profiling, yeah, so the whole RNA or messenger RNA is extracted from a sample, yeah, it is um, um, reverse transcribed, yeah, and then a poly T primer is used if you want to only amplify the mRNA, yeah, because mRNA ends in a poly A tail, um, so yeah, then you have a poly T primer which allows you to amplify only mRNA, um, but you can also use like random primers or random hexameric primers yeah, which amplify all of the RNA, um, but then you're also amplifying things like ribosomal RNA which you're generally not that interested in um, but if you are interested in in micro RNAs or short non-coding RNAs or any of the other types of RNA which are not messenger RNA uh, then then of course hey you you want to use these random primers uh, but do be aware that if you ever want to do like um, micro RNA experiments uh, then <laughs> smiling is not uh, not a not a proper one um, unfortunately, I can. Uh, uh, but hey, if you if you if you're and so there's a big difference in the in the efficiency if you're using uh, poly T primers because then you only get mRNA, um, and if you use random primers, uh, then had the random primers uh, will amplify all of the RNA, but then like most of it will be rRNA, so ribosomal RNA, which is in 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 high amounts in in all of the samples. Um, another application is SNP genotyping. Um, by having two probes which have more or less have a difference of one base pair, um, hey, you can hybridize a uh, sample to these, hey, then you get two intensities, one for the um, variant, for example, which has the A base pair, one for the other one, which has the G base pair, and then depending on what the ratio is between the A and the G intensities, you can say if a sample is homozygous AA, if it is heterozygous AG, or if it is homozygous GG. So you can do SNP genotyping and this is one of the things that is happening a lot. Um, yeah, so expression profiling and SNP genotyping are kind of the two main things that people do with microarrays. Um, and SNP genotyping will kind of cost you like 80 to 200 euros per sample. Yeah, so then for 80 to 200 euros you, you get an idea of um, what the genetic makeup is. So which which 
uh, which single nucleotide polymorphisms there are in the genome, and so you can kind of build up a genetic map. And so a lot of these... Uh, <laughs> Smile is also not one. <laughs> let me see what is, what is the closest one for that. Uh, let me open up uh, the engine. All right, so it is actually... Um, so it's, it's not called smiling, it's called grinning. If you, uh, if you want to change your thing. I'm I'm sorry. I should have put in a in a, in a lot more. Like, no. Uh, but head. So that's that's one of these major. Uh, these are the two major things that people do. So hey, they use it for regression profiling and SNP genotyping. And SNP genotyping is something that you can, for example, do when you buy one of these like. 23andMe or Hereditary or these kinds of things, right? Then what they do is they, they don't sequence your genome. Um, generally what they do is they do SNP genotyping with like a high density array. So they, they measure your DNA at 200,000 little points. And then based on the known genome sequence, what they do is they then kind of um, impute the missing data, right? So hey, if you know that, well, we in our database we have like an individual which has an A at a certain position and then it has a T afterwards and then you can of course infer what the base pairs should have been between the A and the T if you have a, a large amount of, of data from like random people. Uh, one of the more newer applications which is kind of not used that much because in this case if you want to look at um, at uh, epigenetic effects, like modifications which are done on the DNA, uh, then generally people go to DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing. Um, but you can do like you can look at um, if a region in the genome is methylated or if it's not methylated. And so if you have a G base pair or a GC, uh, then then the G of this can have a, a methylation group on there, so a methyl methyl group on there. And you can use microarrays to kind of get a, a genome-wide overview of which areas of the genome are methylated and kind of not accessible and which of the regions of the genome are not methylated and are accessible for expression. So that's kind of a slightly different step. Um, but you do that using chip-on-chip uh, -chip kind of methods hey, where you um, first use a, a, a particular protein. Um, hey, so DNA RNA bound to a particular protein is immunoprecipitated um, and then you do uh, an epigenetic or a regulation study. So all of these things can be done using microarrays um, but the most two most common ones are expression profiling and SNP genotyping and comparative hybridization is still used a lot um, when you just want to compare two tissues or two, two other things to each other. All right, so the common uh, microarray workflow um, consists first of, I think I showed you guys this slide already at the beginning, but I'm just gonna go through it. And so this is more or less um, how you do it. So first you have to create your microarray if you're if there's no microarray available. Um, so it, like for a lot of species like humans and mouse and cows and these kinds of things, you can just buy a microarray. Um, but if you're working on some kind of tropical fish that you are studying plus five other people in the world and then of course there won't be a microarray specific for your type of fish or your type of lizard and so um, then you need to create your own oligo arrays and creating the oligo arrays is very similar to doing primer design so we have our primer design lecture and of course have for oligo arrays um, the same thing or the same kind of parameters are important as are for uh, when you are doing um, an oligo array. Yes, so hybridization temperatures and stuff, had all of these things you have to take care of. Um, but fortunately, many of the big microarray manufacturers, hey, they have like a nice web interface where you can submit your probes that you want to put on the array um, and then they will tell you, okay, so hey, then they do kind of a primer three check of all of your probes to see if they are compatible with each other and they will suggest alternatives. Um, but it is one of the fields of bioinformatics and hey, like currently we in our group, um, we are we have designed a new microarray um, which does SNP genotyping for a very specific type of cattle um, called Deutsch Schwarzbuntes Niederungsrind, yeah, which is um, a, a very small breed. There's like three to four thousand animals here in Germany, and 
a couple more outside of Germany, but that this breed is, is very small. So for this breed, there's not a very specific array. And there are cow arrays, but just using the cow arrays, you kind of miss the thing that you want to see because these and these cattle are interesting because they, they, they have genetic variants which do not occur in the standard Holstein Friesian cow. And so that's why we designed the microarray. So that, that's, and that's science where you can write a paper on how you designed the arrays and um, yeah, but yeah, in the end you get a file which is called a TDT file um, which is more or less a, a description of how the probes on the array should look like uh, and a company can use this TDT file to kind of um, kind of instruct the spotter to make these microarrays. And then you have the biological part. Yeah, so the biological part is to acquire your samples, extract DD, and so you just get a PhD student that does that for you in the lab. Um, and then, of course, the hybridization and scanning is something which uh, bioinformatics is involved again, again, because it, hybridization and scanning is something that is also like you have to have software which goes from having a TIFF uh, file and which reads the laser intensities. And so there's there's also a field um, had people working at companies that make these machines had that are involved in like image processing and had image matching and had there's a lot of things that you that you can do. Um, yeah, because you need to do like dot detection of these arrays and yeah, so there's a whole bunch of additional steps where still a lot of optimization can take place. Um, then the data storage is done in a cell file and cell files are the files that you usually distribute. So if you have done an experiment and you want to share it um, or you wrote a paper about your experiment and the journal says well you need to make your data publicly available and then generally you are sharing the cell files because the cell files contain kind of the information on, on the probes, like hey, what is the composition of the probes, what were the intensities, hey, but they also, they also have a whole bunch of other metrics um, that is normally lost when you go to a TXT file in the next step. And so what you then do as a bioinformatician, you take several of these cell files and then you extract the expression levels from the cell file. Hey, you then have to do norm data normalization, which is also just a standard text file. Um, the next step is gene expression clustering, where you cluster samples together or you cluster genes together to see if there are patterns in your data, like hey, is a certain, hey, are the immune genes upregulated or is it all of the genes involved in like uh, muscle development which are up or down regulated. And then of course the next step is data interpreta interpretation, which doesn't really have a file type, so I just call it a txt file. Data interpretation is normally done in, in like a Word document where you just write down, okay, so this is what I see and these are the patterns and, and this is what I want to do with it. All right, so bioinformatics is, um, is and like I told you, the design of the oligomere so the, the is, is very much similar to primer design. It's, it's highly specific, they, 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 the primers should target only the sequence that you're interested in, they, they're, they're, they are not allowed to have any interactions with themselves, they cannot form hairpins, and so if you're interested in, in or if you want to design a, or have to design a microarray in the future, um, then of course the primer design lecture will help you to kind of have a overview of where you have what you should look out, uh, look out for and which mistakes you shouldn't make. And then of course there's the image processing software like spot identification and the calculation of the different intensities where also bioinformatics is involved. And the analysis part and the statistics are of course also the bioinformatic part and it's bioinformatics responsibility when you do a microarray design. Alright so um, the analysis of microarrays is more or less three groups. So the first or is, is three steps. The first step is the normalization. So normalization is done because you need to compensate for a lot of artifacts which are not due to biology but which are due to the way that microarrays work. Um, so one of the most annoying things, I, I wouldn't say annoying, but one of the things which is common in microarrays is that the behavior of uh, um, C3 and Psi5, they are not similar the intensities that you get from a Psi 3 probe are different. So the dynamic range of the two dyes are very different, so you have to compensate for that. Um, there's a lot of variation that can happen during the hybridization phase. And for example, if you do your hybridization and the temperature outside is, is 
five degrees warmer and inside of the lab hey, you can have an airco and you can kind of try and keep it exactly at 20 degrees hey, but there will always be little temperature variations little temperature uh, variations in like air humidity and of course hey, that makes an, a microarray scanned on day one slightly different than a microarray scanned on day three um, and of course one of the other variations which is very common is the, the target DNA quality and quantity um, because hey, if your target DNA has a very um, high quantity hey, then of course you should put less on the array but again these things are not like a hundred percent you cannot be a hundred percent accurate um, the quality also matters a lot like if your DNA is a little bit fragmented or hey, if you did a, a, a reverse transcriptase step um, which went wrong so hey, it, it, it didn't really amplify like sequences properly um, hey, because it had a bias or had hey, in one sample you have like a massive amount of these ribosomal genes and hey, then of course these things have to be uh, um, compensated for one of the other things is that microarrays are manufactured in batches um, so the best thing would be to get your microarrays all from the same batch um, but that doesn't happen so it sometimes happens that one of your microarrays was produced like a year ago and the other microarrays were produced like yesterday or or 10 days ago right so and this also makes a difference um, every batch of microarrays they have their own like unique qualities and this again depends on like the temperature when they were manufactured but also the quality and the accuracy that you can manufacture them with so that's why we definitely need to normalize furthermore and you want to compare groups of data and because generally you have like disease tissue or healthy tissue or if you have like fat cells with liver cells with brain cells and these kinds of things and so you want to compare data of different groups different biological groups and of course you have to use statistical methods to do that um, and then generally in the last step you want to cluster data um, and then you want to see kind of similar expression profiles hey you want to see that oh in the 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 cells that were infected by a certain virus uh, these genes go up um, while in normal genes that this doesn't happen um, so that would make these genes important for kind of figuring out how the virus is entering the cell or how it is replicating um, yeah, so clustering is one of these things that we do a lot to kind of um, yeah, because you can't look at 50,000 genes at the same time but you can look at a tree uh, which has like 50,000 root nodes and you can still see patterns there but in, in like a matrix filled with numbers seeing patterns is really hard all right how long have I been talking I've been talking for like 46 minutes so I think we I'm going to take a short break and then we come back and we talk a little bit more in detail about normalization um, so there's two different types um, but I will stop the recording now then I can have a cigarette go to the toilet and I will be back in like 10 minutes all right so first break I have prepared really beautiful gifts for you uh, the first break is cows right? no pigs first break is pigs second break is koalas so um, I will see you then in like five to ten minutes and in the meantime enjoy the kind of sweet and loving cuddling pigs during the break. All right, then see you in five to ten minutes. <laughs> 